Awesome. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Danny Zaki. For those of you that I have not met here before, uh, I'm an organizer with the San Francisco Bay Chapter of Sierra Club and work on Bay, Shoreline, and Water Issues. Tonight's webinar is part of our monthly educational webinar series that we've been doing on water related issues. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, uh, definitely let me know in the chat. You can put your email in there and I'll add you to my list. Uh, tonight, I'm super excited to introduce Vicki Vasquez, a marine biologist focused on shark ecology. Vicki has traveled all over the world doing research and has even, uh, excuse me, and is even the founder of the Ninja Lantern Shark, which I hope we hear more about. Uh, she also appears regularly on Shark Week, uh, promoting lesser known species of sharks. And I feel really, really lucky that she's here with us tonight. So with that, I'll just pass it over to you, Vicki. All right, great, thank you. I'm very excited to be here and talk to everybody. Um, what I thought I would do, which uh, I felt would work really well for the Sierra Club, is to actually um, parallel my experiences with, um, uh, let's see, let's see if I can share my screen, uh, with the uh, adventures uh, that I've had and, and how I think that can kind of relate back to enthusiasts such as yourselves that are interested in the Sierra Club and just kind of what I learned about um, how important it is to make sure that you are supporting the right kind of groups when you go and you travel. Um, as you are all part of the Sierra Club, I'm sure you're all become experts of your neighborhoods and where to hike and how to utilize different nature, natural resources. But the more that you travel, that impact and the choices you make start to become more and more uh, important. And so, and through my um, experiences doing shark research, I um, unintended um, but I learned that uh, information as well. And so that is what I would like to um, share with you guys. I see somebody wrote, go Aggies. I went to UC Davis too, so cool. <laughs> um, and this was also me cleverly stalling to see if I could figure out how to share my screen, which I don't think. You um, should be able to, um, at the bottom of the screen, there's like, should be a green. There we go. Yeah. It was only allowing me to like change things. It was, it was odd. Anyways, okay. So now here's the button part. Okay, there we go. Okay, so there's the talk that I created for everybody today. And um, basically what I wanted to do, sorry, I'm just adjusting my screen here. Um, is, is walk you through uh, some of the work that I've done. And before I do that, I thought it might be a good idea if you knew more about myself. So um, I am a researcher and primarily what I research are different species of sharks. Um, my master's work at Moss Landing Marine Labs focused on deep sea uh, sharks like uh, lantern sharks, but I'm also very interested in coastal sharks like the sharks that we have in San Francisco Bay. So in my photo that you see here where it says researcher, we're actually getting ready to tag a soup fin shark. So I realize it's a bit of an unfortunate uh, common name, but they actually have a very positive rebound story here in San Francisco Bay, which I had the opportunity of speaking um, about to Point Malate and the Bay and sharks in general. And another thing that I do is I'm an educator. So I go out to a lot of different classrooms, um, and teach students from all ages, all the way from like kindergarten to city college level uh, about sharks in all sorts of various forms. And then the last thing that I do is outreach. So something very similar to this, whether it is a talk uh, doing public outreach, trying to reach anybody and everybody that is interested in sharks, but uh, even through some really cool TV opportunities, which has included uh, some episodes on Shark Week, uh, Shark Week, which I would like to talk about at the end. And that were some of the photos that I was trying to make sure I got in. Uh, so a little bit more about myself and how I got started. I've always grown up fishing, uh, which I realize is a little bit different for, for those who might come into marine biology world in a completely pure like activist diving um, approach, which I love and very much envy. 
but it's a good reminder that not any not everybody who is a water user, especially a user of the oceans, you utilize it in the exact same way. And so I come from a lot of people who fish. Um, this includes uh, Venezuela, where my dad is from. So there's a picture of me fishing in Venezuela with my grandfather in the background. There's a picture of me fishing in San Diego. Uh, my mother is Mexican. Uh, she is a fan of maybe eating the rewards, but not necessarily fishing. So that's why she's not in the photos, but very lovely woman. <laughs> so what I want to speed up to, though, was what got me going from just experiencing nature, as most of you do, to, to wanting to become much more focused, not just in biology and sciences in general, which I personally always uh, thought I would do, but really honing in on sharks. And that was during a fishing trip to Guadalupe Island, Mexico. At this point, I only I only known the island as a location for fishing. I wasn't aware of a much more famous reputation that you might know of um, if you ever watch Shark Week. Um, here, I just have a little picture of how tiny the, the bed was. Um, for those that aren't used to going on boats, uh, this might be surprising, but for those of you who aren't just hikers, but also divers, you might be aware that sometimes you get a very skinny accommodations when you get onto those uh, dive liveaboards. Some of them are also pretty nice, but in my case for a fishing trip, it was a skinny little bunk. And the point of me just mentioning all this is also to give you the idea of how much effort I had put onto this trip. And the picture that I'm about to show you is me about to get the largest fish of the entire trip, which was going to be a big moment because that meant that me competing against all the other fishermen, which by the way, I was the only woman on the boat. Um, I was going to win the jackpot, win all the money of the fishing boat. It was really cool opportunity, but then somebody yelled shark. So this was my moment of really combining the way I love and use nature with what became my career. The long, the short version of this story is that in pulling up my catch, thinking I had missed the shark and was still gonna get this award, I was wrong. And so in this picture, you see a fish head. I apologize that this is a little uh, aggressive for, for some people, but uh, hopefully it's not too graphic. Uh, what I just wanna point out in the picture is actually my face and not the tuna head at all. Because the face that I'm making here isn't disappointed that I just lost the jackpot. I'm actually in awe because the tuna head that you're looking at here is actually still breathing. It's moving. It's it's something that you don't actually get from like a still photo. And this was really a significant moment to me because what I realized was actually the true intelligence of sharks. So what I had witnessed was a shark, a great white shark, very effortlessly swimming kind of past this tuna that I thought had gone out of the way just in time. And what really the shark had done with no effort, it didn't look like it had swam faster. It didn't do any big dramatic, you know, jaw behavior that you see on TV. And just with no effort had gotten all the meat of this tuna, um, avoided that bony head, and yet had done this all so quickly that the head was still operating. So neurons are still firing. This thing still is, is trying to breathe. And that's when I realized there was so much to be learned about sharks and just the environment. What you kind of see on, on the TV side or what you might read about is never the same as what you experience. And so as you see me talking, the other thing that I want to impress upon uh, all of you nature goers is how much that same power of telling a story um, is important and that when you do it, uh, you're having a really big impact on all the people that are listening and they will make choices based on the stories that you tell them of your na na nature experiences. And so from that experience, I went to Mossel Bay, South Africa to learn more about great white sharks because they were so much more complicated than I realized. And um, the most interesting thing that I learned was actually um, on the far corner of the screen, I'm kind of showing with my arrow, you kind of get that picture of a great white that's sort of gaping at the um, camera, which is a lot of times what you see is kind of like a scary image of a great white. But really what a lot of this experience was, was sitting on the edge of a boat waiting for a shark to come by. And yes, sitting on the edge of the boat, because uh, even though we were throwing chum in the water, 
Uh, the sharks weren't actually aggressive or dangerous. This isn't something I'm recommending anybody do by any means, but just giving you a more realistic um, uh, idea of what it was like for me at this specific time doing this research. And sharks can actually um, only swim forward. They can't swim backwards. So when you're looking at this bait rope, don't think of um, an animal about to grab it and then tug backwards. Actually think of something that's just going to kind of pass by. And my goal is to actually remove the bait rope really, really fast so the photographer in the far right photo can actually take a correct identification of the dorsal fin. And so that's the middle photo is me getting the chance to, to take one of those identifications. So here is actually um, from that experience, what I realized was, was that the sharks were a lot more mundane than you might think. And also South Africa is a huge spot for cage diving. It's one of the world's renowned hotspots for cage diving with white sharks. And it's also one of Shark Week's biggest locations for filming. And from there, this, these, this isn't uh, the only great white shark hotspot in the world though. Uh, the other one that I actually started to work in uh, and actually became involved in the cage diving uh, industry was uh, much more local, Fairlawn Islands. And from these three different experiences, not all having to do with cage diving. Um, one, I was recreationally fishing. The second one was actually research. And only at this point at the Fairlawn Islands did I become more involved in the industry part that uh, a lot of uh, people, the public, are, are more likely to have an experience with a white shark. And this is where I realized that it's actually really important to make sure that you're making the right choices with um, who you select as your cage dive operators, making sure that they operate safely with sharks. Um, a lot of people um, can find the idea of cage diving controversial because of the idea that they put chum in the water. Well, the Fairlawn Islands is actually one location where you can still go cage diving and they don't throw uh, chum in the water. Um, with that said, there have been some studies in South Africa that try to see if they could prove the sharks had any sort of habituation uh, to the chumming that they did. And at the last time I looked at actual published scientific studies, there was no correlation. Not saying that should uh, convince you or make you necessarily feel completely okay with cage diving or every single type of practice, but it just um, convinced me that it is possible to do cage diving the correct uh, way. And it is possible to do it with chum, but as you can see with the Fairlawn Islands, they decided to avoid the option altogether. Now, going back to this whole cage diving with great white sharks, there are a lot of groups that play with those rules and abuse them. So if you've ever seen a shark inside of a cage, that actually wasn't because the practice of cage diving with great white sharks is actually dangerous itself. It's because there's these little tricks that different operators might do to try to give the uh, clients that are in the cage more of a thrill. But in doing so, that can actually be more dangerous to the great white shark. Because uh, if anybody remembers, I mentioned earlier that sharks can't swim backwards. So what happens is that if somebody is putting a big, um, attractive looking tuna steak, which is what often is used as part of the attractant to bring the sharks by, they use this steak and then the shark gets really close and they move the stake at the last second and the stake is now faced right at the cage. Um, if they're not careful with the way that's going, the shark could go right into the cage and can't swim out of it. So apparently in Guadalupe Island, there had been enough issues and even a death of one of the great white sharks um, where the 2021 season was closed. And I believe the 2022 season is, is closed as well. Um, now, this isn't to say that all charters are bad. Um, if you can see closely, I put the photo source of one of the um, pictures that I got off the internet here. And that's actually a, a charter that I've personally um, worked with. Um, 
and their other operations along the, the Channel Islands. And so even though I know that that is a very reputable and safe group to use that doesn't cut corners, um, there obviously were other bad players out there. And so um, if there, if you're the kind of person that's like, you know what, I, I think, you know, this is a cool opportunity and it should be possible, then you'd want to make sure that you're supporting the really good operators out there and taking that extra time instead of just being like, okay, is the season open yet? And then just grabbing whatever operation is out there. So you can see that making the right choices um, can have a huge impact. And it doesn't, again, doesn't mean you have to abstain from it completely if you decide to get involved. And, and so for many of you, even though you may not be interested in cage diving in any way whatsoever, you might be the nature person to the rest of your friends and family because you're going to Sierra Club talks. So that speaks a lot for you to begin with. And so um, knowing some of this background might be extremely helpful because you're the person that people will trust and depend on for making the kind of choices that they can responsibly um, interact with the environment. So from that experience, that obviously led me to San Francisco Bay. One of the most important things that I ever learned, as much as it's great to be interested in great white sharks, there are other things. And for those of you that are part of the Sierra, um, club, I'm sure you had the exact same thing for birders, for really epic trails where there's a lot of people, you know that there's these really big, big pools, um, pulls, P-U-L-L-S, pulls, uh, to these um, attractions, but there's so much more around um, surrounding those environments that um, if you're like me, you think are are equally worth getting excited over. And knowing these kind of things can be really great. So that way certain locations, hiking trails, for example, don't get oversaturated. So bringing, back, bringing that back to sharks, people are obsessed with great white sharks and don't realize there's over 500 other species. It's funny to me that um, so many people are obsessed with when, where, how, maybe, how often does a great white shark come into San Francisco Bay, when the truth is that this is very unusual. Um, it happens, but it's it's not um, a significant part of their life history, meaning that if we're thinking about San Francisco Bay and we're connecting it so strongly with sharks that we name our hockey team after it, then we should really know more about than just one species, especially the species that spend a majority of their lives there. And if not a majority, really critical parts of their lives, like uh, using these areas as nursery grounds. So one picture here is me uh, working to tag a seven gill shark. Um, this is a young pup. They can actually get uh, closer to sizes of um, seven feet, a couple hundred pounds. Um, the one in the middle is a leopard shark, also a juvenile. Both of these, um, in these particular situations, I was using something called um, Floyd tags. And what this means is for anyone who's fishing or using the water, divers, for example, um, every once in a while, you might see a funny thing sticking out of an animal, and that could be a tag. Uh, a really great way that you can contribute as a citizen scientist, basically a researcher without having to get a degree, is by reporting anything that you see or come across that has a tag, because there is somebody out there that would love to know that you saw that animal. Now you might be asking, well, how do I get so close that I look at the tag? Well, for fishing, that's how that happens. A lot of times um, there are fishermen who, who collect these animals, see the tag, um, you know, hopefully they'll they'll release the animal, but in that brief moment where they actually have it in their hands, they can actually look at the tag, it has a phone number, and they can give a quick update on the animal. Um, and this is similar for a lot of different terrestrial species. For those of you that are great photographers, this is where the camera can come um, in handy. And if even if you don't get, get a great tag or ID on anything, this is where a program like iNaturalist um, can really come in handy. So iNaturalist is, is an app that you can use uh, on your phones. 
Uh, the other thing that I learned from my work in San Francisco Bay, which I'm sure many of you are already aware of, is just plastic pollution. And this is something that I'm sure you all see on your hikes. It's very irritating. I'm sure many of you have stories like I do of going on a walk and that moment during the pandemic when you started to see people hang their masks along trails. It's very frustrating to see. Um, there are weird things of trash like trash like that everywhere because that kind of human is just all over the world. And we can see from the picture here that that kind of issue has been plaguing San Francisco Bay since 1952. So we have a leopard shark in the first picture that's been caught by some sort of plastic around the neck. And then here in 2007, the same thing. Um, this picture was taken by the Marine Science Institute in Redwood City, which is a great education and outreach organization. Um, the happy story with the shark on the right, the, the, the photo in color, is that they were actually able to, to cut that band off and the shark was able to heal. The other picture is 1952. I can at least tell you that the lifespan of a leopard shark is not so long that would still be alive today anyways. So now moving on. If you do see something in the bay, there's tons of beautiful hikes around there. Uh, if you see something weird, I know uh, what many people may have um, coming to mind is the huge die-offs that happened recently with a lot of different animals in, um, in uh, the bay. And unfortunately, this is something that is uh, the, the cost of living by the water. Um, do I think it's an acceptable cost or a fair cost? That's a whole different conversation. But with um, it being so easy to pollute the water with just uh, natural things like your laundry soap, which um, goes through your um, uh, washing your clothes and, and gets clean that way. Uh, there's all these things that kind of sneak in and 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 affect the water quality. San Francisco Baykeeper is a really wonderful resource um, where it may be hard to kind of pinpoint what exactly is the cause for one of these things going wrong, but there's so many that if you just see something, at least I wanted to make sure people knew that there was a hotline where they can go and they can report it. And I'm just realizing now uh, that I misspelled uh, the bay. So it's 1-800 uh keep bay so there's an extra e there uh at least you can see it in the full uh screenshot of their report pollution um web page um so you can also go to that you can either call the number or you can go to their site so again uh there are things that you can do to to try to help and this is just what i kept saying over and over and over and over again um as i was trying to do shark research uh, if I could do blinders with the shark research, that's probably what I would have uh, chosen, because as you can see, that you realize how much of a responsibility people have. So now I moved on to lost sharks, and this seems totally left field, but it actually isn't. And it goes back to this whole importance that we all have of being able to speak and tell our nature stories. So... Lost sharks, if you look it up online, I'll start here <laughs> why I have these like sci-fi um, and, and TV things, is because if you just look it up cold, the lost sharks, you may not get to the right place. So make sure you add uh, uh, something in there about lost sharks, deep sea sharks, research, science, another keyword. But what you want to get to is something a little bit more like this uh, piece from NBC News. Uh, the lab that I studied in... Um, at uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs was called the Pacific Shark Research Center. And the head of that was Dr. Dave Ebert, who got, who's also coined uh, the lost shark guy because he kept trying to let people know about these, these rare sharks, these sharks we don't know a lot about that really need um, our protection. And as you can see, the concept it, uh, itself can be hard to get because I bet all of you at home are like, okay, I don't, I get that this shark needs protection. That part clicks with me, but it's not lost. I know it's a hammerhead. Well, this is a lost shark. So the picture um, that should have just come up is a news clipping from BBC News. This is a ghost shark. 
um, it kind of reminds me of the dragon from Never Ending Story. Um, this it turned out to be a new species that was uh, mailed to my uh, professor from grad school, Dr. Ebert. And in doing more analysis, they found out that it was actually a new species. Now you might be thinking, who goes around mailing random sharks? Well, in learning about all these animals, I started to realize how often new ones are being discovered. And it's insane. Uh, here you have uh, an electric torpedo ray. Um, on the top, what just came out was a, a different type of ghost shark. This is Lana saw shark. This saw shark, it has literally a saw on its face. Uh, this, the next one is a barbed wire tail skate. So not a stingray. Um, there's also a close group to the rays called skates. And so that's why I like to bring that one up. And another deep sea uh, shark, this one called a dusky snout cat shark. The lab uh, that I um, used to be in uh, has described about 50% of all new species described in the last decade. And as you can see from these pictures, these aren't a lot of species people are familiar with, not a lot of the kind of animals someone would associate with the word shark. And this is how that term lost shark got coined. And in learning more about this and looking at a map very similar to the, the one that you see right here um, that was put together by Dr. David Ebert, uh, what you're looking at is a lot of hotspots around the world for sharks. And so what I was thinking about at this point in my career is like, okay, like I've traveled around for great white sharks. Now I want to travel for these lesser known lost shark species and, and really get the word out and, and learn more about them. And I was really interested in this question mark over here off of Central America, because as a Spanish speaker, uh, not a great one. I speak it as a second language, uh, but I still give it a try and I still do it because I thought that it would be so advantageous to be able to, to, to work with some of the uh, uh, Spanish biologists, Spanish speaking biologists there and somehow be some sort of liaison. So I was really excited. And this was the huge vessel that they used. To, to, to conduct this work off of the uh, central coast of America. And this goes back to what I was uh, saying a little bit earlier about another thing that I realized about lost sharks. In my head, I'm thinking traveling the world and I actually ended up at the California Academy of Sciences. And that's not very far if you live in San Francisco like I do. And what I realized is how important museum collections are. So how are all these new species being discovered? How does uh, my professor get one of these things mailed to him? Well, it's actually because a lot of times there's these things in museums that haven't been well looked at. So really what um, is often getting mailed to him is something that's been sitting in a museum for who knows how long. And I had a chance to participate in that. So here I am thinking that the way to help save the oceans is to go really far. And here I get the, the very obvious reminder of how important it is to, to go to museums, support museums, remind people of all the cool things that happen there and, and, and to remind people that they change. You know, they have different exhibits. Um, they really try to keep in mind that uh, they want to entertain you when you come to the museum. So I, I love that they think about that. And so going back to my challenge now of here, I thought I was going to go really far away. Instead, I'm looking at this shark that's been in a container for about five years. And here's a photo of the fresh specimen. So um, from my journeys of just field work, which is where we started this conversation, uh, now I'm going into lab work and realizing that discovering and proving that a species exists is incredibly important. Most of it happens in the lab and you're looking at, it kind of feels like Indiana Jones. You're looking at this old specimen that's already decayed. This is the one on the top. And, and yet what you would love 
is this, um, this is the picture of the exact same specimen when it was first collected, nice, fresh, alive. That well, Wouldn't that be so much better? Um, but to really do this work and, and the reality of it is, is a lot of times things are caught through bycatch. Bycatch is when you are fishing for something like shrimp and you instead of catching exactly the shrimp you want, you catch a bunch of other things um, accidentally. And in that process, many of those things that you've accidentally caught, your bycatch can die as a result. So the, this kind of work, looking at dead stuff, dead stuff in jars can actually be really important because you might be looking at things that were caught accidentally on a boat trying to fish for something else. Um, in this specific case, I already showed you the research vessel. So really what it was doing was um, studying a, uh, a coast that is incredibly popular for fishing and getting a better idea of what the animals are there, because it's also a little difficult to get the specimens from bycatch. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to get them on your own. This was uh, one research vessel that did one trip and the contributions to research, just so you know, were huge. There were multiple, multiple species and research projects that came off of this. So until deep sea, you know, submersibles are a lot cheaper, unfortunately, looking at dead stuff is um, how you can find out that something as cool as this exists, a lantern shark. When these things are actually in their deep sea environments, they glow in the dark, which is how they got their name. And one of the things that I think is most incredible about them is actually their size. So you can see off um, in one side here, we have a full grown shark that fits in somebody's hand. For scale, there's another picture of, uh, it looks like this is the same species, um, the size of a pencil. There are over 40 species of lantern sharks. So when I've written lantern shark here, I don't mean a lantern shark like there is a great white shark. I mean, there are multiple species of lantern sharks, just like there are multiple species of hammerhead sharks. And these glow in the dark. And the fact that more people don't know about them really, really surprised me. So then that was the other thing that I learned from my work that I think is very applicable to nature enthusiasts, which is making sure that whatever you fall in love with, especially when it's not the stuff that a lot of people know about, that you communicate it. Because without you, that stuff can be forgotten about or essentially lost like a lost shark. These lantern sharks actually have tiny little um, spines along their, their dorsal fins, um, presumably to help with uh, protection. Uh, their underbellies are what tend to, to glow. Uh, presumably as a way of helping hide their silhouettes. So think of it more as glowing as an invisibility cloak, as opposed to glowing to make sure that everybody knows that you're around. So very, very fascinating and a different approach than you might think of from other sharks. And yet here's a shark not a lot of people know about. So when I had the opportunity to maybe discover and prove a new one existed, I was really excited. At the point of this study, there were a total 37 species. Um, so that's why I have that number there. There's more since, but when I was trying to do this specific project, I had to prove that my one species could not possibly be any of the other 37 existing ones. And here's some of the things I was up against. Dermal denticles. T uh, sharks have teeth on their skin. It's really small. It's like microscopic. Um, and so these are some of the small pictures that you see here. They can actually differ the, the like des design, the way these things morphologically look from group of shark to group of shark. So within the lantern sharks, you could like further subdivide them. It was really interesting to find out how nerdy you could get with lantern sharks. Even their color patterns were unique. So some Sharks had these little skinny color patterns along the sides of their bodies by their tail. So like this area, hopefully you can see my, my arrow moving. Um, and then there was this very mysterious group that didn't seem to have any markings. And that was this group right here. So just from looking at, at basic uh, morphological characteristics, the stuff you can see with your eyeballs, I was able to really um, hone down and figure out that 
my shark could only be nine of these existing species. And so that meant, okay, now I just have to go one by one and prove it's not any of the nine species that you are currently looking at. Well, there are some things that helped. Like for example, the velvet belly lantern shark is kind of pink. And so with things like that, it actually took me down to just three other sharks that I had to tr try to prove could not be this mystery thing I had in a jar. And after some work, it turned out I could prove it. So it was very, very exciting. And this goes back to, again, the, the part of, um, for you, I would parallel it to when you get ready for a trip. Um, there's so much involved that you, it might be easy to stop thinking about the, the storyteller part um, of you. And like, how am I gonna tell this story to somebody later? Do I just wanna do it through word? Uh, would I want to do it through through photo or video? And, and I'm certainly not uh, encouraging everyone to to go too overboard overboard with like camera phones and stuff like that when you're out in nature. Maybe your thing is drawing or sketching or like I said, just being a good storyteller. But when it came to this shark, I wanted to use that storytelling process because I did not want it to be forgotten, like all the other lantern sharks, which are essentially lost sharks. They're very very um, understudied and not well known. And so to do that, here were my uh, clear picture resolution photos of this shark. And I got some of my cousins to help out and come up with a really cool name that was going to be very, very eye catching. And so this is how we came up with Edmopterus benchlii. If you have no idea what that is, this is why I've put this little placard on the side that kind of looks like the Jaws poster. Peter Benchley is the person who actually created uh, the whole Jaws story. He's the author um, of the original book that later became the movie. Um, on the top are the co-authors of the paper that we were able to publish on this. And in the bottom is the common name that my cousins came up with, the Ninja Lantern Shark, because the shark has such a dark coloration and, and it didn't have as many of these photophores, the glowing um, parts of the body as other lantern sharks have. So we kind of were thinking maybe that helped it be stealth, even stealthier in the water. And, and you know, the fact that it has those those cool um, spines on its back and they're so curved. It reminded us of having weapons again, like, like a ninja. You're just, you have all these cool attributes. You're ready to go. And um, that really worked with the outreach. So the other picture you see is actually a high school group who helped campaign to make sure that the Ninja Lantern shark name stuck and, uh, and it worked and it, and it, had a whole big media press it it got on all sorts of stuff and went viral and it was really great because it did that job of making sure people didn't forget that glowing bioluminescent sharks exist they're not all scary some can be as big as your hand you might also be thinking why did we name it after peter benchley who created this book jaws that like terrified so many people well he also dedicated the rest of his life to ocean conservation along with his wife, Wendy Benchley, because even though they liked a good spooky story, they certainly had no intention of creating such a, a villainous character that would represent and, and notoriarize sharks in general. And so I think that's really important to remember is that that wasn't the purpose of the goal at all of Jaws, even though that can be hard to, to to think of now and especially knowing like how famous that is but also think so many people nowadays that love jaws just kind of love sharks it's 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 a weird combo and it's and it's not um coming from a bad place and so that is what we wanted to harken back to is this idea of just a, a love for sharks and and remembering that there was something um really positive that peter benchley did and that was you know so much uh uh, conservation effort. And of course, Ninja Lantern Shark is a fun, common name that can always stick around. So that actually led to uh, work like uh, Shark Week. So the Ninja Lantern Shark got went viral. And, and that, um, I think, helps uh, put me on the map for groups like Discovery. And this came 
uh, gave me the opportunity to go to Tokyo, Japan and be a part of the very first group to ever tag a goblin shark. Um, and the show that we were on for Shark Week was called Alien Shark Stranger Things. The big goal was to tag, oops, keep going for it. This goblin shark, which you see that we did, it was a wonderful um, experience in the process of writing up the, the paper. But there's a lot of other amazing sharks that we saw. Um, here, um, I love this story. This is uh, the Japanese uh, cat shark. This is part of a, a species called demon cat sharks. That's the one that you see of uh, the three of us holding. Um, because these sharks are so rare and difficult to see, the, the screenshot of a shark that you see underwater is actually a close relative to it, just so you get an idea of what it would look like in the water. But that is not actually the species it's, itself because that is how hard it is to see them. The reason I'm showing you that picture is because in the middle of all that other shark week craziness, I'm I'm like, I can't believe all these different species of deep sea sharks I'm seeing, a bird beak dogfish, uh, kite fin sharks. The two professors I was with, Dr. Ebert is in the middle and Dr. Uh, Kasuhiro Nakaya is on the far uh, right. Well, my right, since I'm looking at the screen. Uh, he, they were so excited to see this, this Japanese cat shark more than all these other ones. And this is much smaller than the other ones we were seeing. We're looking at these six, seven foot long sharks. But this one was the shark that Dr. Nakaya had discovered himself in 1975. The photo you're looking at was taken in 2017. That was the first time he had ever seen that shark alive. So I just want to point out how happy he looks and what a special um, moment that was for us. And that wasn't the only shark uh, that we saw. Uh, hopefully this video will work. Um, I don't know if the sound will, which is completely fine, but what you're looking at. Oh, nice, nice. Hasta la vista, baby. Okay, so what you were looking at there was the release of one of Japan's uh, angel sharks. They actually have two different species. They have the Japanese angel shark and they have the clouded angel shark. I believe I'm saying that correctly. And so it was also just this wonderful experience as you can see they're getting to, you know, uh, look at these amazing sharks with these top research biologists, getting to see them go swim back in the ocean. Here's a couple more that we saw. Oh. Uh, the, the one in the far corner that my arrow is over is a frilled shark. Uh, these things can get seven, maybe six feet long. They're very skinny. It basically looks like a snake in the water. They're very fascinating. One of the most ancient sharks out there. Uh, the one in the middle is adorable. It's a type of, um, uh, this guy was a type of, another type of cat shark. It's like a shy shark. And as you can see, uh, because we had taken it out of the water, we're putting it back um, shortly after this photo. Uh, it's kind of hanging in a bucket of water at that moment. But its response to being scared or disturbed is to curl up like that. So I love this picture just as a reminder that sharks aren't not, not just different, but they behave different. They're not all these apex predators that are at the top of their food web. Some are like this little shark that are just like, ah! <laughs> I just want to hang out under rocks and the rest of you leave me alone. And just, you know, very sweet and adorable looking. The one on the far right is a saw shark. Um, as I mentioned, these are amazing animals to see in real life. They have chainsaws on their face. Nothing I don't think can ever get cooler than that. And the, the thing that I learned um, from this trip uh, was that Tokyo Bay is full, filled, filled, filled with amazing species. I'm holding another lantern shark that we think might be uh, uh, very unique or at least interesting, worth worth a look at. Uh, look at. And it's just because, um, one, we were surprised to see it there, but two, just the colors of it. You can see it's kind of got this purple shimmer, uh, beautiful eye. Um, and uh, this next video that I'm going to show you uh, oops, is something we, that we don't always get to see in um, in deep sea shark science. 
uh, which I didn't get to see with the ninja lantern shark. And so if you watch carefully, what you're going to see, there it is, is beautiful live footage of that lantern shark swimming around in the water. And so getting footage like that can be very, very difficult. The way that we made it work out in this case that you're looking at is we use bait and a very, 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 very deep camera uh, that uh, Shark Week which was able to create to, to handle the pressure of going down and have enough battery to hang out there until we looked at the footage again later. So it was very, very exciting for us. Um, and then moving on, I'm going to try to speed up here. Um, so that way anyone can ask questions. This was my trip to Cocos Island. Uh, Cocos Island is a marine protected area uh, off the coast of Costa Rica. This one was called the Hunt for Lagertha. The photos you see here were from the other uh, scientist on board, uh, Dr. Craig O'Connell, who you can follow at, at the Shark Doctor. Um, so they're beautiful hammerheads, the critically endangered scalloped hammerheads. You can see these in huge schools. Uh, there's also these really cute um, white tip reef sharks that almost look like little kittens. They like to, to sleep together in these like little packs, like puppies, very adorable. Um, we used all sorts of equipment to, to look and study this area. And uh, you can see we, we're using these acoustic tags to try to uh, attach it to the fin so it kind of clamps on. This was all designed by Dr. Craig O'Connell and help us see some short-term uh, short movement activity. Uh, we used uh, another bruv similar to the video that you saw before. So using a baited remote underwater video system so we have uh, a video, some fish, and then this was a huge deal for the trip, looking at white tip reef sharks. Uh, I'm sorry, these are silver tips. Very, very understudied. This was the first time the Costa Rican biologists were actually able to get um, tagging data, and, and it was felt so special to be a part of this. Uh, we also use an ROV. So this is uh, a ro remotely operated um, vehicle. So it kind of feels like you're playing a video game. So we had all this great equipment to go study the underwater areas of Cocos Island. And like I mentioned before, uh, even getting to tag the silver tips was uh, a very huge deal. So the take home of those last two, I kind of brushed through them together, but that's because they all, they both had the exact same message. And that was sustainable seafood choices, which might not seem like a direct message, but it was. The whole reason that I was able to see all those amazing deep sea sharks that I showed you was because um, of the grace of a fishing boat, which might sound weird to say for those of you who um, try to eat, uh, very responsibly uh, when it comes to seafood. Uh, but without them letting us go on that boat and and be a part of their um, their fishing day, we wouldn't have been able to collect the information that we had. But the method that they were using was incredibly devastating. It's gillnet fisheries. That's how we were able to see those animals. We didn't commission it. We didn't ask for it. It's basically the job of any fishery observer. So if you ever hear about somebody being a fishery observer, thank them. It's a really tough job. You're just uh, basically reporting what uh, somebody catches by accident as they try to go for what they really want, which in that case was uh, crab legs. And here in the Cocos Island, this is a very popular place for divers. And one of the big things they like to look for is tiger sharks. And this entire area was overrun by shark finning. And it made it very difficult to see things like this uh, silver tip uh, shark that's in the photo. And so uh, seafood choices might be something that you've heard many, many times again, but it kind of breaks my heart when I ask different researchers, like, what do you think about this? Or what's the message you have for people when you're traveling all around the world? And what can somebody do at home? And it's not just going always back to sustainable seafood choices because of how important that is, but because they're literally there seeing all the time the direct devastation of it. So here's these people trying to, to do research and learn about sharks and their very incredible um, 
fascinating migration movements. And they're not just doing that for fun, they're doing it as a reminder so we can understand where these sharks are traveling, which are basically these huge danger zones for shark finning. And what one of these Costa, Costa Rican biologists was able to do, uh, Randall Rouse, was uh, make at least Cocos Island a marine protected area. So there's a, a place that's great for diving, um, but after all that effort, of course, you would wanna use a really uh, responsible uh, dive operator. And, and this is just such a good reminder of it. It might seem like, oh, why would I have to do that? Because you know it's protected. There must be so many rules that they have to follow. But just like the rules that people have to follow um, for going cage diving with great white sharks, it, it it shouldn't you shouldn't trust that someone just follows the rules because these places are so so special and that's what I really learned from from Coco Island was just um, don't just put your your trust into something just because uh, they're supposed to take that responsibility. Uh, this was just such a great example of of why finding good dive operators is important is is because you're helping support maintain this beautiful ecosystem. Um, more so recently, and I'm going to go really fast on this last one, uh, but there's only three slides. And that was my recent trip this year to Papua New Guinea for epaulette sharks. I love deep sea sharks, but walking cat sharks are one of my secret favorites, uh, which is no longer secret. I say secret just because you may not think uh, I would go for such a shallow water shark but these things can actually walk out of the water. And there's so many species. And it's actually, in my opinion, another great example of a lost shark because some of these species were recently discovered. These, are, these can be in popular areas for tourists, um, coastal areas, um, intertidal areas, coral reefs, all places and great reminders of why we want to protect them and that our everyday choices have huge impacts here. So uh, the shark that you're looking here at is a hooded epaulette shark. I would uh, probably say this is the most beautiful of all the epaulette sharks. They're incredibly uh, difficult to find. Uh, this is uh, a couple of pictures of the um, the fake coral setup that we created. So uh, you can kind of see in, in the picture in the middle, there's like a hole. So we put some bait in there and just we're really hoping that the sharks would be curious and maybe go in and check it out. So that way we could capture them with our cameras and collect a couple of um, bits of information on them. So things we did was uh, take uh, Floy tags, um, one on two of them in case the divers could give us information. And uh, these are what these Floyd tags look like that I mentioned earlier. They're just these long, bright colored uh, bands. Um, and then the other thing that's really interesting about these types of sharks is that all the spots on their bodies are incredibly unique. And it's actually how you can differentiate, differentiate between species. Um, some species might look really obvious, like the, the Papua New Guinean epaulette sharks that you're looking at right now. But then if I go back, you can see just from this sort of blurry picture, we'll go back one more. This is a completely different looking shark, uh, but they're not always that obvious. I just put those two pictures there because they're the most contrasting. So um, very pretty. So that is my last slide. Um, I will stop my sharing now. And if anybody has uh, questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Vicki, that was incredible. Um, I'm gonna ask folks if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or raise your hand. We do have a question already from Will, who I will say is five, staying up and watching the presentation. So that's great. Uh, will asks, what color blood do hammered head sharks have? Oh, good question. All sharks have red blood, just like us. Um, as soon as it hits the uh, air, it's oxygenated oxygenated but oh okay because he asked that I have a really other cool thing to tell you goblin sharks because they live in the deep sea and there's not much going on they actually have this really thin skin and because of that you can see all of their blood and because of that when you look at them they're actually pink with like per, uh, with like blue fins which is super funny because you may not think that a goblin shark would be big and pink <laughs> 
Thanks That's for staying awesome. up. <laughs> Hi, Will. Um, if there's any other questions, go ahead, folks. Uh, feel free to, um, you can unmute, you could raise your hand, uh, or again, throw a question in the chat. I have a question if, if no one else does. Uh, my question is, is if you could go to any place that you haven't been yet to do sh shark research, where would you go next? Oh, I know exactly where I'd go. Um, I would love to go to where my family um, is from in, in Venezuela. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's a bit of a dangerous area, which was similar to Papua New Guinea. And so in going and traveling to places like that, it's, it's, really helpful when you have uh, resources like the Discovery Channel because they made the trip to Papua New Guinea really safe. They had, um, uh, I, I should have shown you a picture of this. They had a security guard there for us and it was like the Kardashian security guard whenever they go to Australia. So we were pretty, we were pretty cool. But uh, honestly, all the people we met were incredibly, incredibly kind and nice. So, um, so yeah but Venezuela is the short answer. <laughs> awesome. And it looks like Will has another question. Go ahead, Will. What do goblin sharks eat? Ooh, goblin sharks like to eat uh, other fish and maybe even little shrimps. And if you can find a video later of a goblin shark, I wish I could have shown one, but their mouths go really fast like this. And they're the fastest jaws in the entire world. <laughs> awesome let's see are there any any other questions at this time I'm not seeing any um great so I, yeah I guess um that will be it Vicky thank you so much for your time that was incredible. I've already gotten so many messages asking if this was going to be recorded. It will. It will live on our YouTube channel. Um, like I said, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions, uh, and I can share this as a resource. So thank you again so much. This was incredible. Yeah. So hopefully everyone saw there. You can follow me on social media at Vicky Shark. Um, if you have more questions, you can ask there. And if you have any good ideas of where I can go next let me know i'll tell shark week see if we can convince them awesome yep and if you uh if you need anything else just let us know otherwise have a great night everyone thanks, thanks for listening <laughs> yeah thanks vicky bye